Morning conference, right? Well, good morning. I'm Chris Merritt with the Ohio Association of Broadcasters, and on behalf of the OAB, the Indiana Broadcasters Association, and the Kentucky Broadcasters Association, welcome to the Midwest Broadcast and Multimedia Technology Conference. As many of you here know, the OAB has put on this engineering conference since 2003, and the conference has evolved through the years, but the core purpose has remained, and that is to bring together engineering and technical staff from radio and television stations to discuss issues and challenges in the business, and to provide vendors the opportunity to showcase their latest products and technology needed to succeed in an ever-changing industry. This is the first year of our partnership with the IBA and the KBA to present this conference, and we've rebranded it as the Midwest Broadcast and Multimedia Technology Conference, and we're so pleased to have both the IBA and KBA as our partners. Dave Arland and Sam Clement, are they here? There they are, and uh, Chris Winkle and Scott Kaysen from the Kentucky Broadcasters Association are, have been great partners to work with this year, and I have tremendous respect for the work that they do for both of their associations. They're both relatively new there and have been doing some amazing things, and so we're hoping that this is the beginning of a long-standing partnership. As it has through the years, this conference reflects our appreciation for the work that you all do here. The engineers and technical staff, every day keeping stations on the air, Im implementing the continual blitz of technology changes, and helping us manage through emergency situations. Without you, the news doesn't air, the music doesn't play, and the remotes don't work. We have nearly 250 attendees and exhibit staff at today's conference from Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky, and several other states, and we thank you all for being here. A key component of this conference is our exhibit hall, and we're delighted to have about 50 exhibiting companies from all over the country, including several attending our show for the first time. Our exhibitors contribute significantly to the success of this conference, and without their participation, we would be a much smaller and less interesting event. In these times of reduced budgets and staffing, we want to ensure that our exhibitors feel their investment in our conference is worthwhile. And so during the break and our lunch today, we hope you'll visit with our exhibitors, see the latest updates from folks you know, and get to know some of the new companies that are here with us today. Please thank them for their participation, which helps make this conference possible every year. You may have seen the great door prizes donated by some of our exhibitors, and we had an initial drawing which Chris managed uh, during the breakfast, and the drawing for our remaining items, including the L LG 4K television, will be held just prior to our closing general session this afternoon. So be sure to drop your business card in the basket at the registration desk, and remember you must be present to win. So before we begin with our first session, I would like to acknowledge a few groups and individuals. First, our partnership with the SBE and SMPTE. We rely on local SBE and SMPTE chapters to help promote the conference to their members, and our great turnout today is a credit to their efforts. A list of the chapter chairs is included in your program. I'd also like to extend a special thanks to our conference sponsors. First, the sponsor of today's lunch, the Telos Alliance. Telos has been a strong supporter of this conference for many years as a sponsor, exhibitor, and presenter, and we are grateful for their continued support again this year. Next, thanks to Comrex, the sponsor of breakfast this morning. Comrex is another longtime sponsor of this event with their sponsorship presence each year as, and also as an exhibitor. Thanks also to LG, which donated the beautiful LK television that will be given away as a door prize later, at the, later today. And we also thank Gates Air, our bags and lanyard sponsor, NPR Distribution Services, our AV sponsor, Fuel Graph Chimney and Tower, sponsor of attendee gifts, Everts, our parking sponsor, Sweet Life Systems, our registration sponsor, and Nautel, the sponsor of this morning's break. So let's have a round of applause for all of our sponsors. Thank you also to our planning committee. This group does a great job of developing the conference program and ensuring that the sessions focus on the most relevant issues facing our industry. Our program committee members can be identified by the blue ribbon on their name badges, and we hope you'll share any feedback or suggestions you have 
uh, to improve the conference in future years. And finally, a personal thank you to our OAB staff members, Andy Hartzell and Tony Richards, for all their hard work in coordinating today's conference and trade show. Andy and Tony started at the OAB earlier this year, so this is their first experience uh, with this conference, and they've done a great job managing and coordinating all of the pieces and parts that go into an event like this. And thanks to Kathy Cooper and Aaron Thomas, who come back each year, probably a familiar face to many of you, to help at our registration desk. So with all those thank yous, let's get started with our opening session. To moderate this morning's panel is Blake Thompson, our program committee chairman. Blake has been our uh, conference chairman since it began uh, in 2003 and has um, played an integral role in the growth and development of this conference. He is supremely patient with me when I don't understand what the topics are coming in during our call for presentations. In addition to uh, chairing our program committee, he is the OAB's ABIP inspector and does a terrific job throughout the year inspecting stations. So Blake, thank you for all you do and I'll let you take it away. Thank you. All right, while we work on that part, thanks, Chris. Our uh, opening session this morning is going to focus on a multitude of frequency and regu regulatory issues. Uh, there's issues, opportunities, and challenges, because that's what regulations are. They're opportunities to do something and challenges for all of us that we need to be aware of. We have a distinguished panel of experts here, the Regulatory Council for our three sponsoring state broadcast associations, along with the NAB spectrum policy expert. Let me introduce the panel to you. First, we have Stephen Hartzell, who serves as the regulatory counsel for the OAB. He's a partner at Brooks, Pierce, McClendon, Humphrey, and Leonard LLP, and an, has been an FCC communications lawyer for almost 20 years. He advises broadcasters and other FCC-related businesses on a variety of regulatory matters, and his practice focuses on matters impacting daily business operations of stations including FCC licensing, licensing, closed captioning, and other accessibility issues. Next is David Oxenford, a partner with Wilkinson Barker Nauer LLP, who serves as the IBA and KBA's regulatory counsel. He has represented broadcasters for over 35 years on a wide array of matters from the negotiation and structuring of station purchases and sale agreements to regulatory matters. His experience includes all areas of broadcast law, including the FCC's multiple ownership limitations, political broadcasting rules, EEO policy, all those little trivial things that uh, can trip you up, and technical rules. In addition to representing a wide range of station groups, he also represents a number of state broadcast associations and trade associations for media brokers, program, and service providers to the broadcast and digital media industry, as well as banks and others providing financing for media companies. On the end is Bob Weller, Vice President for Spectrum Policy at the National Association of Broadcasters. He uh, took that position in July 2014. Prior to that, Bob served a number of technical and management roles at the FCC and as an engineering consultant to the telecommunications industry. During his 15 years at the FCC, he was the Chief Technical Analysis in the Office of Engineering and Technology and also Director of the Denver Field Office. He was a Senior Consulting Engineer for the firm of Hammond and Edison in San Francisco, and Bob advised clients and designed numerous radio and TV stations and related facilities. He started his career at an AM-FM combo in the San Francisco Bay Area and is a three-term president of the AFCCE and two-term director of the IEEE. Gentlemen? Let's get started. First up, we were going to talk about the, the, the first impending issue coming up right, right away is C-band. So, so who wants to start off on C-band? Uh, okay, um, so the FCC has said uh, F you to broadcasters. Um, it said F you to the satellite industry. Oh, I'm sorry, F you means flexible use. <laughs> <laughs> get it right, get it right. Um, the, um, the FCC back in uh, August of 2017 uh, proposed considering the entire what they call mid-band spectrum, 
uh, from 3.7 to 24 gigahertz for flexible use, or at least parts of it. Less than a year later, um, they broke off uh, the C band, the C uh, 3.7 to 4.2 gigahertz satellite downlink band, um, as the kind of the low-hanging fruit, if you will, in, in, in their view, um, as, as the first band to be opened up for, uh, for flexible use. And uh, broadcasters, our, immediately, our immediate reaction was, uh, no way. We, uh, this, is, this is the band we use for uh, uh, distribution of network programming, both radio and television. Um, you start allowing mobile operation in there and point to multipoint services, it's going to be a disaster uh, for us. Um, in contrast, um, some of the satellite uh, operating companies got together, they came up with uh, a plan to refarm, repack, groom, uh, whatever you want to call it. Um, some of that spectrum so that it could be reused or used for flexible use. Uh, it took broadcasters a while to kind of get on board with that, um, but eventually I think we were convinced that, uh, yeah, 200 megahertz, you, we, could, we could get by with, uh, without 200 megahertz of that spectrum and, and uh, just live with the remaining um, 300. Um, Congress and, and the FCC basically said, nope, that's not good enough. You gotta come up with a higher number. Um, the higher number, uh, we think, we still don't know, is, um, is probably around 300 megahertz. That's going to be very invasive, I think, particularly for the, uh, for the television industry. In order to get to that point, not only do uh, C-band users have to retune receivers, maybe repoint some dishes, um, they're also going to have to uh, uh, change their uh, modulation uh, waveforms to more efficient ones. New satellites are going to have to be launched, uh, probably new uh, high-efficiency video codecs are going to have to be employed, this is, this is all going to be very um, in, invasive. It's going to take a couple of years, but it's coming. Um, the FCC is, is likely going to vote uh, on the C-band reallocation at its December meeting. And if you back off a few weeks from that, there's something called the white copy deadline, which is next Thursday. Um, and that's kind of the drop dead date by which principally the chairman's office has to lay out exactly how this is, this is going to happen. Um, there's a lot of moving pieces um, going on. Uh, there's uh, some members of Congress that are, uh, you know, insisting that the uh, uh, certain members of the FCC staff have to come in and testify about how uh, how an auction is going to work in this band, and that's highly unusual to have staff members of, of that level come in. But um, we live in interesting times. I'll just kind of leave it at that. So if everybody remembers, last year we went through an exercise, and I hope everybody in this room went through the exercise of registering their potentially unregistered downlink C-band dishes with the FCC. And that was all in furtherance of building the record in this C-band proceeding, which I think was intended to serve two purposes. One was to actually create um, a viable inventory for the commission to understand just how much the broadcast industry uses the C-band, because dishes, downlink dishes never had They've, they're not required to be registered, but only by registering them does the government understand that they actually exist or, and are in use. And then second of all, to the extent that there winds up being some sort of plan for uh, any kind of reimbursement that has to do with retuning 
or repositioning or God forbid getting new equipment, um, the registration of those C-band dishes was important. So I, it's too late at this point, but I hope everybody in this room took uh, the admonition seriously. Uh, I think all three associations, state associations in this room, um, put that information out to their membership, and I hope that everybody took advantage of that opportunity to register their downlinks. One thing it shows is that none of your spectrum is secure. I mean, look how many times we've seen TV already shrink. We've seen TV auxiliary bands pulled away. Um, now we see the C-band disappearing. So far, there haven't been a lot of calls for repurposing of the radio bands, but, you know, who knows? Um, just be aware that you've got valuable commodities with your spectrum, and there's lots of guys out there that want to use it more and more with new technologies all the time. So, uh, you know, make use of that spectrum, make good use of that spectrum, and uh, be ready to defend other calls to take some of that back as we go for further along into the future. Okay. Any, any quick questions on the C-band? Go ahead. Yeah, so the question was about uh, what, what are the international implications. And so already they're uh, within the ITU. Am I not turned on? No, okay. Well, keep going. I'm, I'm pretty loud. There we go. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, already within uh, ITU region one and three, I believe, um, there is a, uh, there's a, Actually, I think within all the ITU uh, regions, there is a uh, mobile allocation in in this in this band. Um, in uh, Asia, it's starting to be used. Um, in in Europe, it's starting to, it's starting to be used. S but um, the U.S. and ITU region two and in in South America um, have been. You know some of the uh, some of the holdouts because we're a little bit unique in how we use C-band. It's less uh, extensively used um, elsewhere in the world. But you're absolutely right. It's used for content uh, distribution not only within the U.S. but between the U.S. and Canada, between the U.S. and uh, and Mexico. And when you when I talk to the satellite operators about whether that capability is going to be preserved, um, they assure me that it is, but they're a little bit short on the on the details. Okay. Uh, next up, we'll do a let's do a radio topic. We all well, actually, it's radio and TV. License renewal coming up next year for everybody. TV will be one year later, right? So. What do you guys have for license renewal warnings? <laughs> so license renewal is obviously a big deal. It happens once every eight years, as you know. Uh, the first thing that every general manager is ever told when they get a new general manager position is whatever you do, don't lose the license. Um, the time where a station could potentially lose its license is typically at license renewal time. And as, as engineering managers, <laughs> And as technical staff, as with every other member of the staff at every station in the country, everybody plays a role in helping to not lose the license. Um, for technical staff, I think that the principal um, issues for license renewal, and it's a good idea to start thinking about this now, don't think about it when license renewal time rolls around, which will start for this group in uh, renewal applications will be due as early as June 1 of next year. Start thinking about it now. A April 1 for Kentucky and Indiana. April 1, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, we got to think about this stuff now. And engineers typically at the station, as you all know, are tasked with doing that which other people either don't understand or don't want to do. That sometimes includes interaction with the public file. It certainly includes interaction with uh, technical plant 
And the principal issues that we're going to deal with in the license renewal context are whether the uh, online public file is complete and correct. You have some interplay with that. You're not responsible for issues program. I would be surprised if people in this room are responsible for issues programs lists, but you're responsible for applications for licenses, authorizations, STAs, and so forth that need to be in the public uh, inspection file. You also might wind up serving as the bridge between the rest of your station staff and the use of the online public inspection file system and when there are problems uploading and you have to help them troubleshoot how to get documents into the file. In addition, there's an RF radiation piece to the license renewal application that you'll need to be conversant with where we have to be able to certify to the commission that the station has not run afoul of the um, RF radiation standards that are in the rules and in addition, there is a certification about whether the station has been, for radio stations, whether the station has been off the air for a period of more than 30 days at any time during the license renewal period, during the eight, during the eight year period. Typically, that can be ascertained by looking at FCC filings, but that of course presupposes that any time a station was off the air, for, 30, for more than 30 days, that the station did the right thing and made a filing with the commission to let the commission know that the station was off the air for that period of time. So it's a good idea to begin going through your records to figure out whether there were any periods of time where the station was off the air for more than 30 days, especially if the station did not notify the commission and request special temporary authority to be off the air so that you can begin to deal with figuring out how to handle that when it comes time to file your license renewal application so that you're not trying to recreate that story at the time of filing. Instead, you've already done the due diligence ahead of time in order to get there. What else you got to add? Yeah, a, whole, a couple of things. Um, one is you guys do end up with the responsibility a lot of times of the public file, at least making sure that other people have done what they're supposed to do. It's incredibly important because now everybody anywhere can see what's in the public file because it's online. You know, the public interest groups, those that want to make trouble for your station can look at it at their breakfast table in their pajamas and fuzzy slippers with their cup of coffee just by opening up their laptop and Di uh, typing in WXYZ public inspection file and there's all the information. You know, make sure that stuff is there. Two stations in the first license renewal group got fines of 15,000 bucks because they had no quarterly issues programs list. Even if you're not responsible for them, check out the file and make sure that they're there and go find the programming guys and say, hey, get something up there because the FCC seems to be lenient so far for people who have made an attempt, even if it's a late attempt, to get documents into their public inspection file. Also, use this as an opportunity to check out your technical operation uh, for all aspects because there's a lot of licenses that get renewed along with your license renewal. Your um, main station licenses will obviously get renewed. If you've got a translator and it's in the same state, you can renew that on the same form. If it's in a state that's got an earlier uh, license renewal period, you know, it's across the border, then it actually has to file um, in that earlier license renewal window. If you've got auxiliaries, STLs, remote pickups, those are automatically renewed with the license. But if you've got private radio licenses or satellite uplinks that are licensed, those are entirely different schedules. Check out those schedules and make sure you don't miss the license renewal dates for, the, for those licenses. Um, looking at remote pickups and uh, aux other auxiliaries that are broadcast auxiliaries, they're automatically renewed. Nobody bothers to ever look at those licenses once they've been licensed until you get an FCC inspection or until somebody complains or until somebody tries to reclaim some of the spectrum and finds out that you're at the wrong place. I've had lots of clients suddenly find out that, oh yeah, the uh, STL is originating from the studio. Unfortunately, it's the studio that we moved out of three years ago and nobody bothered to re 
orient and the license to come from the new studio on the other side of town. Make sure that stuff has been taken care of. I've seen situations where TV stations have had uh, multiple hops to get to their transmitter sites, and at some point one of those little towers in the middle of those multiple hops got moved someplace else and nobody bothered to tell the FCC and that ended up in some big fines when somebody finally did discover it. This is a good time to go back and check all that stuff out. The RF radiation, as Stephen said, yeah, that, that's uh, important. It's probably not going to be too surprising because most of your uh, stations, if they are the same way that they were last license renewal, you don't have to worry about it. If anybody put a licensed facility on there, um, they had to do an RF radiation study, make sure that you get access to that RF radiation study. If there was a TV station on your radio tower that, that changed its antenna or somebody else got added, make sure that they're, they're still in compliance, but they probably would be because they have to certify that to the FCC when they get their um, CP granted. But if there's any unlicensed facilities that are up there, micro, uh, certain microwaves, certain um, um, low power transmitters, make sure that they're there. If you've got an AM that, that they've taken into account, the RF radiation uh, from those sources. Also, if you've got an AM with a fence around it where the fence is required to keep people out of areas of high RF radiation, make sure that fence is there and that it hasn't fallen down and that the lock hasn't disappeared at some point during the uh, uh, license renewal term. I've had clients ready to make that certification. Oh yeah, we need a fence around our site. Went out there and didn't find the fence that they thought had been there because they hadn't been to the site for a while and ended up making a really quick visit to Home Depot to build a fence in the last week before the renewal so they could check that box. You know, do all those things now where you've got a couple of months before uh, um, the license renewal is due. Also remember that two months before the license renewal, you've got to start pre-filing announcements. Make sure somebody at your station knows to do that. And that's basically an invitation to everybody in your listening audience to file petitions against your license renewal. It says, hey, we're filing a license renewal. You can look at our public inspection file. And if you don't like what you see, you can tell the FCC in Washington. So you're inviting people to scrutinize you. This is the time to make sure that everything is in place and the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed. That was well said. The other thing that I would say is keep in mind that not every, as you go through the process that David described, not everything that you find that might be wrong at your station is necessarily subject to disclosure in your license renewal application. So if you were to find, for example, that your EAS logs were not up to date, that's probably a rule violation, but it's not one that you necessarily have to proactively confess on your license renewal application, but I would encourage you to proactively <laughs> confess it within your organization so that your organization can, can get its arms around any internal uh, issues that it needs to deal with in order to make sure that all the, all the regulatory I's get dotted and T's get crossed. That's just one example. I'm not going to go through all the examples, but not everything that you might find is necessarily subject to disclosure at license renewal time. When I uh, started as an FCC inspector in 1984, the most common violations were public file and EAS. And I was having uh, dinner sitting next to, to Blake last night. I said, what are, what are the common problems you run into now? Public file and EAS. <laughs> so Some things never even, change. Even though nobody's looking at your, uh, your, your public file, it's uh, at, uh, at license renewal, renewal time, that is the one time it does get looked at. Uh, by the way, on EAS, since both of these guys mentioned it, make sure your box has been updated. The digital certificate for FEMA to send out its mes messages by the IPAWS internet-based uh, alert system, that digital certificate expired on November 6th. The update to the boxes didn't get sent around till like a week before, and I think a lot of people have not pressed the little button to update their boxes so that if FEMA sends out an alert, and they're the ones sending out alerts from the president, um, that, that 
you won't get it if you haven't updated the digital certificate. The FCC has given you to January 6th to get that straight before you have to ask for permission. It's not a hard thing to do, as I understand it, but just get around to doing it. And, and if you do, if you haven't updated yet and you miss an iPods, make sure you log it. Because, yeah. you know, that's the other part of this. Is you, if, if you miss one, you still have to log the fact that I missed that one, and here's why, and here's the purchase, you know, the, the date that we're purchasing our update, if, if it, there's some delay in that. So, you know, those logs are there for a reason. They're so there to, to help you, cover you, too, to make sure that you're, you know, keep that, that stuff all, all up to date. Okay, let's, uh, let's move forward to something TV, something that everybody's here been working on probably for the last six or eight months or more, and that's uh, repack. Where are we at in the repack so far? A lot of us have already switched, not necessarily to full service antennas, but. Why is everybody looking at me? This is. Uh, <laughs> You're the spectrum man. This is, <laughs> this is where I start coughing. And <laughs> Um, so, uh, to, to listen uh, uh, to the commission, the uh, uh, repack is, is going uh, swimmingly. Everything's uh, right on schedule, even ahead of schedule. And um, actually, it is, it is, it's going pretty well, I, uh, I, I think. The <laughs> well, here. Uh, oh. <laughs> So, so there, uh, the, a concern that I have um, is something like a quarter of the, uh, the stations um, who are to have transitioned to the new channel, they've, um, they've done that, yes, but they're not yet at their uh, full power full height uh, facilities because uh, the tower crew got tied up at the at the previous job uh, the uh, antenna wasn't uh, delivered on time the uh, there is some issue with the uh, with the uh, local jurisdiction getting a, uh, a permit there is issue with the transmission line there's some somebody none anyway there's there's a whole list of of reasons why uh, things are not uh, fully completed. Uh, a consultant suggested it's likely to take three more years um, to fully complete the, uh, um, the transition, so I'm not sure whether that's, that's uh, accurate or, or not. Um, but I think in, in terms of stations getting uh, reimbursed, there was a significant uh, shortfall in terms of the funds available for, for reimbursement. And uh, NAB recognized that from the uh, very beginning. We started uh, working with our, our uh, friends on, on Capitol Hill to try and get some uh, additional money um, carved out. And we got you know, another uh, billion dollars, which is um, probably not much in, in DC terms, but uh, it's a, a fair chunk of money. So I, I feel like there's enough uh, money out there for uh, all stations to be uh, fully reimbursed all all of their um, all of their expenses. I'm hearing kind of mixed um, uh, uh, comments that. Oh, the, we have no problem at all getting uh, getting our reimbursement. It came through right away. To, you know, it it got it got denied. They told us it was going to get approved, but uh, you know now they're changing their mind. They're asking for all this uh, additional documentation. Um, so I I think there are a few um, hiccups. Um, were for stations that have. Uh, changed band, gone from, say, a UHF channel to a VHF channel, that seems to have the greatest amount of impact, and I guess not surprisingly, on uh, over-the-air listeners, uh, sorry, over-the-air um, viewers. Um, the FCC maintains a, uh, a website, and they, uh, they provide us with the analytics on, on that, um, and the, the, the website is a, it's a consumer 
oriented website for the repack, um, providing guidance on how to rescan and those sorts of things. And typically, the traffic on that website is is I don't know a few hundred a week, some something like that. Um, it jumped uh, one of the uh, one of the stations in Los Angeles moved from a, uh, a UHF channel to a VHF channel. It jumped to like two hundred thousand uh, during the week when that uh, when that occurred, and that pattern has been fairly consistent across all of the uh, uh, markets where there were UHF to, to VHF changes. So that's, um, that's going to be a, um, I think that's going to be a challenge. I think there are, we'll, we'll see more maximization type applications uh, at some point once the FCC opens a, uh, a window for that or, or uh, but so it's it's frankly going better uh, better than I better than I thought, but we're supposedly um, so the end of the transition is supposed to be July of next year. So we're more than two thirds of the way through. Um, this um, this is going to be because it's winter. Uh, because there's still a lot of uh, stations that ha that have to move, um, there's th this is going this is going to be the uh, the most challenging time for the for the repack. And I don't know. There was a uh, article in TV Technology about you know the repack going off the rails. That's been uh, predicted bef before. Uh, it has hasn't come to pass. I I think broadcasters are. We have to be commended, and frankly, uh, um, the FCC has been pretty good at commending us for doing a good job to just figuring out how to make it, make it work. Is there anybody in the room from the FCC? <laughs> is there anybody in the room, I'm asking seriously, is there anybody in the room who is reporting in industry trade press on this? Okay, so um, I would agree with everything that Bob said. Um, I think the FCC staff has been very flexible with stations in trying to uh, make things work as best as possible. Of course, it's in the Commission's own interest to be flexible and make things work out because they are the ones that established a uh, foreshortened uh, transition period that the industry never agreed with from the get-go. Um, I think Bob said roughly that you had heard roughly a quarter of stations are on interim facilities at this point. The FCC does view that as a successful transition, irrespective of how long a station might be potentially limping along at reduced power. Um, the FCC is, does make efforts and does try to help stations make sure that they don't actually go off the air. But as long as they get off their old channel, that is a checkbox in the success column for the commission in, during the repack. And that's probably not necessarily a checkbox for the stations who are operating at reduced power um, as far as that goes, particularly if it, if it comes during certain times of the year. Um, I think one thing that's also going on is the reimbursement process has become more and more muddled, it seems. The fund administrator has changed, the FCC has changed their outside contractor that they use for some of the fund administration purposes, the, the folks who review filings and um, give a thumbs up or a thumbs down or request more information from stations in order to dispense funds, disperse funds. And um, there have been inconsistent results, which I think Bob referred to, and that's an ongoing problem, and it's really frustrating for stations where a, something gets filed, something gets reimbursed, and then all of a sudden, six months later, this new fund administrator contractor comes in and questions the, an expense that has already been reimbursed. And I've seen that happen on behalf of clients. Um, that's a frustrating process. I uh, would recommend that everybody stick to their guns, take it in stride, 
try to provide the information that is necessary in order to maintain that reimbursement stream. It's a really important thing that we all stick to our guns and that we get fully reimbursed for expenses that are eligible for reimbursement and don't be turned off by the bureaucracy of the fund administrator or the bureaucracy of the commission. Obviously, the commission has to watch its back. It is attempting and it is trying very hard, as every government agency should, to avoid fraud, waste, and abuse. And that's a very serious consideration, and it's something that none of us actually want to um, be injected into the system, right? If we're all doing the right thing, then we don't want other people to get away with fraud, waste, and abuse. And But what that means is that our records are going to be um, uh, examined stringently, and we're going to have to provide whatever justification we need to provide in order to satisfy the auditors. So keep that in mind, take it in stride, continue to plow ahead, don't give up if you think a, an expense is reimbursable, uh, please don't give up. FM stations are just coming into the mix now, they had to file their first reimbursement filings a month ago. Uh, low power and translator stations have to file by today. Um, that make their first filings for reimbursement. It's a slightly different system, but it's highly uh, related. Um, but y'all are gonna run into the same kinds of issues that the full power and class A stations have run into. And so again, stick to your guns, do everything above board, and don't give up the fight if you think you have uh, reimbursable funds. And to the extent that you need commission help in order to make something happen, contact your lawyer, Contact the commission staff. The commission staff really is ready, willing, and able to work with you again because it's in their best interest to make sure that everything goes as smoothly as possible. I was just waiting to see if anybody was going to run out to file their reimbursement request for <laughs> LPTVs and TV translators. I, okay. These guys covered it all. Okay. All right. Any quick questions on that? Go ahead. So if you're a, an FM station and you had to reduce power so your coverage shrunk by more than 20%, the commission would pay for you to build an auxil auxiliary facility to restore your uh, coverage. Yeah, it's but not it, not lost business, but yeah. physical facilities if you had to go to an auxiliary site or um, get an auxiliary transmitter or something like that. So. And it, it, well, you already asked if there's any FCC people or press in the room, so I'll just go ahead. Um, <laughs> the commission, frankly, didn't do a very good job about uh, publicizing that. I think NAB and, and SBE and others did what, what they could, but obviously not everybody got the word that this money was available. And what the incentive auction task force folks at the FCC told me is, they were surprised at the small number of FM stations who had applied for reimbursement by the, uh, the deadline. Yeah, also though, look at your, um, even though some of these costs were not reimbursable by the FCC, look at your tower lease agreement. Sometimes um, if you're forced to be at low power or not being able to operate with your licensed facility for long periods, there are 
there could be breaches of the tower agreement. There could even be some provisions that would uh, require some reimbursement from the tower owner. So it's just a matter of contract. That's not always, in fact, it's not likely that it's there, but it ha is in some tower agreements. So check those sorts of things out too. Likely, if it's not due specifically to the repack, the need to have that those changes made, the fact that you got to pay more to get an engineer, that's not going to be um, reimbursable. Um, it's got to be directly because the guys were climbing on the tower and had to move you up or down to accommodate a new antenna or something like that, that would be reimbursable, not just because you needed a new antenna because your old one wasn't working anymore. Okay. Now, the FCC, though, has given some extensions of FM construction permits in specific instances where the reason that they couldn't um, meet construction deadlines has been because of repack issues. So there has been at least some flexibility there. Generally, they're not going to try to give out money for this, this, this part of it, but yeah, if, it, especially things like if you have to move your antenna because the TV, you know, their new auxiliary side mount ha is right in your, your window that you can apply for those or if you have to build auxiliary facilities, those kinds of things. Okay, well, since we're, since we're back in uh, radio, let's in, in area, what's the latest on this, this buzzword digital AM? Yeah, um, actually, yeah. Uh, one of my clients called me, a guy named Ben Downs from Bryan Broadcasting in, in Bryan College Station, Texas. I'm sure some of you know Ben or have at least seen Ben because he's been a big advocate for uh, digital, for, for AM improvements generally, been on NAB panels at the radio show and the uh, um, show out in Las Vegas for years talking about how AM needs to ad adapt to the times. So about two weeks before the um, show in April, the NAB show in April, I get a call. Uh, Dave, the bend downs with a long Texas drawl I can't imitate particularly well. You know, it's time that we go all digital. Um, these hybrid uh, AM digital systems just aren't working that well. They're not very stable. Nobody really wants to listen to them because they cut in and out. Let's file a petition that stations can voluntarily go all digital. So the week before the NAB show, we did. Um, it got a bunch of buzz at the NAB show. We talked to some FCC people. The week after the show, the FCC put out a preliminary notice saying, hey, anybody file comments? And I think there were, remember how many, 60, 80 comments, all but two or three of them were positive on a voluntary basis. Why not? And the two or three, there were a couple of interesting ones that if you went digital AM, it wouldn't allow for foxhole radios where you can jerry-rig a radio in, in the event of the apocalypse and create your own radio to, to pick up emergency signals, which it didn't strike me as a high priority to stop digital radio from happening, but it was one of the comments that was filed. But generally, the industry was supportive of it, and um, the FCC will be considering it uh, at their meeting next Friday, adopting a formal notice of proposed rulemaking going out to the industry to say, should we allow a digital, full digital AM operation um, on a voluntary basis by any AM station that wants to do that? Now, some of you may be thinking, why would I want to do that? There aren't that many digital AM receivers out there. A couple of reasons. One, it, um, if you're doing a music format, 
Uh, it apparently is really good, at least during daytime hours. Uh, Hubbard is doing a test of it right now in Frederick, Maryland, which is just uh, west of uh, Washington, D.C., where they've been running their station for uh, six or eight months now, uh, full digital with music. And apparently, you know, there's still some dropouts when you go under bridges or behind big hills and things like that, uh, big electric light poles, but it apparently gets really good sound with, with the music format, and they're actually getting better reception during daytime hours than they did when they're in analog. Um, the other reason is if you've, got, if you've got an FM translator. I mean, there have been a bunch of AM stations that said, hey, I've got my FM translator. It covers the area that I really want to serve. Why do I need to keep running this AM? Maybe in, uh, the FCC has said you can't turn it back in. <laughs> Somebody asked about that. Can I just run the translator and get rid of my AM license? The FCC has said no to that. But maybe if you transition to digital, you'd get uh, um, some notice on the AM digital side. About 30-some percent of new cars, as I understand it, are already uh, capable of receiving digital AM, and it's the same chip as for the hybrid system that some stations are operating under right now. It would give you better reception, clearer reception, um, and some possibility of doing music. So I think that's one of the reasons that people want at least the option to do that. May even have some ability to send down data like uh, you know song title information that you can do on FM, maybe other some data uh, transmission capability. So uh, FCC will be considering it at their meeting Friday, put out a formal notice of proposed rulemaking asking for comment. Those comments will probably be due, I would imagine, in January uh, when, with all the timing that goes through or February. Um, and we could see action sometime next year uh, on this. Do you think, so if, assuming the proposal goes through and assuming that um, industry members begin to adopt it, on whatever schedule, do you think that that will help drag consumers and um, device manufacturers across the finish line to make it a to make digital radio transmission generally more available and more viable as a business model, or do you think that it's going to be kind of an island in the radio market? Or do you think that it's going to be the spearhead to finally right? We, we've been we've been messing around with digital for almost two decades, and we're st and we're still stuck with the push pull. Right? It's a push pull economy. Um, if we don't have receivers that are that are widely available and widely adopted um, to receive the signal, then we can never get across the finish line for digital. Do you see this as a spearhead, or do you see it as kind of an island? I, Sorry to take your job. No, no, that's good. I, I think if you don't do something like this, AM is eventually going to be irrelevant. I mean, the only folks that are really successful in AM at this point are a couple of clear channel, small C clear channel stations in some big markets where they've got legacy listeners or a couple of stations that are doing maybe ethnic or... Uh, other programs and some small market guys where they don't suffer quite the same interference that they do in, in some of the big markets. I've got a client in western Kansas who's a very successful ag AM broadcaster because you know they don't get a lot of the um, uh, interference from electric lights like this or um, other transmission sources that you get in, in a city like Columbus or Washington DC or or um, any other big city. But that, over time, is going to go away as more and more digital sources of audio uh, entertainment exists. AM's really got to be, I think, competitive, in, uh, improve the fidelity, and give people a reason to listen to it. And this, at least, hopefully, will give some reason to listen to it. AM receivers have been disappearing in a lot of cars. Uh, some of the electric car manufacturers have started pulling it out because it's hard to shield the AM signal from the, the uh, uh, electric car technology uh, uh, 
the, the, the mechanics that make it run um, so that rather than trying to work with the ways to shield it, they've just pulled it out. Uh, maybe if uh, digital AM is there, increasing the f fidelity, uh, increasing opportunities for people to do something on AM, uh, there might be more reasons for those guys to put the AM back in and for other car manufacturers to leave it in. I'll just say that the United States is the most successful AM broadcast market in the world. And uh, if, to the extent that we're continuing to uh, push the envelope, this is, uh, this is the way to do it. All digital AM, um, that's, that's the way to do it. Cool. Okay, we got a little time left. Uh, we'll do some, take some questions from the audience on any topic for our panel of experts. Go ahead, Paul. Yeah, I've got one question back to the public file thing. Um, and that is, when somebody makes an application and gets a grant uh, or makes the application, is, it, is the onus on the broadcaster to put that in the public file now, or does that just fall out the The application itself will go into the public file. It's your obligation. I get, I'm not sure it's an obligation, but if it's no longer required that that application be in the file once it's granted and followed up with an authorization, the FCC will put it up there, but they won't take it out. So once it's been granted, you can take a CP application, for instance, out of the public file. The FCC won't do that for you. And you know, if you don't clean up the public file every now and then, you'll have a zillion applications over, over time. So the on us. Correct. The, the upload of, the only exception to that is AM applications that are still filed on paper. There are a few of those, but uh, for the rest of uh, TV or FM applications, they're all electronic. They go automatically into the public file. That said, there's been, there have been enough wrinkles in, in the FCC's own systems talking to each other, quote, talking to each other, that when you file an application electronically, you, somebody at the station should go wait 24 hours because it takes an overnight batch processing um, for applications to appear in there. But somebody should go and confirm that in fact it was automatically imported in there. There have been times where for whatever, we just a technical glitch where stuff doesn't automatically get imported even though it should have. And, and in fact, look at your public file. That's a, that's a good point. There are these glitches. There's supposed to be a coverage map in there. And I've had situations where whoever was inputting the coverage map inverted two letters in the call signs. So the coverage map of a station in Indiana was in fact showing coverage in Louisiana or something like that. So make sure that they've got the right station in the coverage map and that all the information is for the right station that's in your public file. I, have, I also have, as somebody who looks at a lot of public files, um, I have a recommendation. Put your call letters in your public file. Uh, when you're doing like issues and programs, put the call letters of the station in there. It makes it a lot easier to find in a group. Or one group I inspected recently, they cross-pollinated. Every public file had everybody else's issues and programs. So every station you went to, you had a copy of all eight stations' public files. No call letters. You had to open them up to figure out which one was which. Now, granted, it was a glitch, but it was still, for me, I had to open up eight of them and every one of them just to make sure that they all had the right things. So, so. more isn't better? Oh, yeah, more is always better, right? Yeah. No, it's, it, and, and as, as the late Jack Clayton used to say, and I'm a firm believer in, don't give them any ammunition. Anything that doesn't need to be in the public file, my boss was, was a stickler for this as well for 36 years. Nothing that is extra in the public file. Put in what's required. Don't give them any extra. If you've got old stuff that's up there on the public file system that doesn't need to be there anymore, go ahead and remove it. It can't hurt, but it, it might. <laughs> no, no letters from us attorneys to you telling you about violations should be in your public file. <laughs> right. <laughs> We've seen that. <laughs> no bills on political advertising that include the check with right. the routing number and the account information. I've seen wiring information yeah, for that. banks yeah. uh, in the political files. You know, make sure there's common sense used in, in the public file. 
Okay, still got a few more minutes. Any other questions? Uh, well, follow up on this thing. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't hurt to check both your online listing for the station and what's in the LMS. I've already done the rules in my station in West Virginia. And there are a whole bunch of translators being sold showing up in the LMS list of stations. Now, it's another place. There's a translator. It took me about three times to get associated with that station. Just right. The license renewal and your biennial ownership reports, which are due before January 31st, all for radio and TV, all have to be filed in LMS. Radio guys have only used LMS really for the last biennial ownership reports. Now you'll be using it more and more because even construction permit applications will be filed there for FM stations. And there have been lots of glitches in the transition. There have been links to wrong stations, wrong licensees, where licenses that people never heard of have shown up in their LMS account. So you got to clean it up. Don't wait to the last day to get into it because there, there are problems that take months. Yep. Only in isolated cases where somebody has a beef with a particular licensee in the last two license renewal cycles. Before that, it was pretty common that you would see public interest groups from Washington deciding to make issues and filing all over the place. You know, occasionally you'll see in major markets certain rights groups complaining about uh, stations not covering issues that they think are important to their whatever advocacy group they happen to represent. But I worry that, um, you know, with all the polarization that's going on in our country, that some public interest group who doesn't like some of the deregulatory steps that the FCC has taken may at some point during this license renewal cycle decide to make an issue about public service from broadcasters who don't have main studios anymore, who necessarily don't have people in their community from nine to five. Um, and somebody may want to make a point by saying, hey, look at this public, uh, these quarterly issues programs list. There's nothing that talks about the community of license. Um, so I, it, it hasn't happened on a widespread basis, but that doesn't mean it can't. It looks like what happens after the renewal cycles get done, there are hardly any that brings up the question of whether, what's the point, even online, when the public isn't using the public? It, it's for the FCC to get at it easy. <laughs> That's not for the public, come on. <laughs> a certain AVIP inspector uh, recently came to a station I'm associated with uh, for something on the home page of the website where apparently there's a link needed for the online public file. But this AVIP inspector was so insistent that there be a contact information, a, web, a phone number, or an uh, email address. What are the rules on having uh, a link on your station's home page to the online public file? What specific needs to be there? So, First, <laughs> yeah. Do you, like do you know this question. ABIP inspector? Uh, personally. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the requirements, and, it's, and it, you saw, I, I, I listed it in the rules. The rules specifically state you have to have a link to your public file and contact information for anybody who has problems with the public file. That's not a person that exists, but it is still required. And, and in addition, you need a link directly to your EEO, yeah, yeah, EEO uh, so, yeah. annual public file report. And, and I am responsible for issues in the program, so the other question I have is like Bigfoot. It's elusive as to what's exactly going on in the program. So well, there is no set duration. You just have to list it. Oh, okay. so where do we go? Or is better? So there's, there, there, well, there, so there's a wide variety. I mean, back in the day, there was, it was prescribed to be 10, between five, five and five 10, 10 yep. issues. And many stations to this day continue to sort of stick to the five to 10 issues because there's a history with it. 
Um, that doesn't mean you have to have five to 10 issues. If you have 35 issues, query whether you're covering them in with any kind of um, significance or not, or whether, or whether you are creating a, a extra unnecessary labor, um, or whether you are actually describing multiple issues the, whether you're breaking down the issues too finely, too, you know, too much of a granular level. Um, you have to include certain information in your issues programs, list the time, title, duration, date, and a description uh, of what you're airing for purposes of the issues programs list. I would be uncomfortable with a station that only identifies three issues that are of significance to the community in the same way that I would be uncomfortable with a station that has 50 issues listed. Um, so is five to 10, is that safe? Yeah, I think that's relatively safe based on past precedent. And then it's gonna depend upon the nature of your programming, right? A television station with local news programming that airs 20 hours a week is always gonna have way more content to draw from than uh, a classic rock radio station that has a 30 minute public affairs show on Sunday mornings. Um, but what I, what I would encourage radio stations to do, and David, I'd appreciate your in, insight into this too, is there winds up actually being, um, even on a classic rock station with a morning show of you know a couple of talking heads, three or four people who are just jawing during the morning drive, there actually winds up being the discussion of an awful lot of material that would be viable for an issues programs list. And the question is, how to effectively and efficiently capture that information so that you're not creating labor for labor's sake, but so that you're actually identifying things that would be useful for, for an issues programs lists so that you're not solely relying on that 30 minute public affairs show that airs at 530 in the morning on Sundays. Right, and, and I think that's a major misperception. Everybody thinks that issue responsive programming is just that boring Sunday morning program that nobody listens to because it's aired at 6 a.m. on Sunday and it's frankly boring. Um, but if your morning disc jockey is talking about the traffic jam that he had in the morning or the potholes uh, after the you know, winter thaw, has come and starts taking calls from all the people in your community to identify the potholes around town and then starts calling the city road commission to tell them where to go to fix the potholes. That's issue responsive uh, if traffic is one of your issues or transportation is one of your issues. Um, so you should list that kind of thing if he's having discussions about what his kids are doing at school and what's going well or not well. Um, you know, that can be issue responsive. Health issues, if somebody's on the air talking about a health problem that they're having and, uh, you know, one of your disc jockeys is going through, you know, cancer treatment and talking about their, his or her journey through the, the treatment process and health is one of your issues. You can talk all about that even though it occurs during an entertainment uh, segment. PSAs can be issue responsive, but they should never be the only issue that, or the only programming that responds to an issue. You should always have something more um, um, meaty uh, that, that responds to it. Syndicated programming can respond to issues. Programming news reports, some, some stations say, oh, I can't list news. Sure, news is very issue responsive. Yeah. Any news coverage that you give about a particular issue would be news respon or issue responsive that you could list under the various issues. So there's lots of sources out there. As Stephen said, it's just a question of finding them and figuring out a way to document them on a regular basis to get them in the quarterly issues programs list. I really cringe occasionally when I look at quarterly issues programs list where their list of issue responsive programs is a list of all the high school basketball games that they've covered. And yeah, maybe if recreation or uh, kids yeah, activities. Yeah. I find those to be pushy a lot. Right, that might be one <laughs> issue, but that shouldn't be the only issue. You should be talking about some of the other things that some of you, I see some gray hair, remember the ascertainment process no. where there used to be community leader meetings where you actually talk to the community leaders to figure out what the issues are. You've all got plenty of people who are community involved at all of your stations. Talk to them. 
talk to the people that they, they know in the community, figure out what the issues are, and develop some ways of addressing programs in some meaningful way that you can list on those quarterly issues, programs list each quarter. Okay. Yeah, basically log everything you can as that, that is beating those issues. In this case, more is always better. So, but make sure they're real, not things like the Friday night football game. Okay, that's it for this session. Uh, want to thank our panel here. That was a nice, informative uh, talk. I'll we, just point out, Blake, you yeah. gave us 22 topics yeah, to we be covered prepared four. to talk to talk about. We talked about four. <laughs> so, well, so, so, so anybody that wants to talk to Bob after the session, yeah, we got, we got lots, we'll be around. Lots of time to talk. Uh, we've got. Uh, we got about 15 minutes before the...